And our next guest is in the waiting area. If you please come in. Um, I know she has a certain time limitation. How are you? Thank Very good. You. How are you? Pleasure. Dr. Bob, Thank pleasure you. to meet you. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me on. So we have met a couple of times. Yes, once at have. Maggie's and uh, once at, uh, I forgot, some the one event that they had at, um, oh, at, at Andre's building that's um, right. for some women. There was it was a judge. Oh, okay. Um Anyway, it was Forgetting an event. It was an right event now. at, at, at right. Andre Wallace's building. That's yes, exactly yes, yes. right. That was a while ago. That was yeah. probably March or February. Yes, maybe? yes, yes. And then again at Maggie's, yeah. where I got That's to right. hear you speak. That's right. So, first name, Alla. Uh, I never say your first name right. I always call you by your last name. <laughs> you can call me by my last yeah, yeah. name. Some people call me AB for sure, but okay. my full name yeah. is Alessandra Biaggi. Alessandra mm -hmm. Biaggi. That's it. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And that's yeah. one. That's the name of one of Mount Vernon's uh, famous Anthony Butler, A B. So oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> awesome. I like it. I like it. So you are running for the seat currently held by Senator Jeff Klein. Mm -hmm. What Thank district God. is that? What? That is Senate District Thirty Four. And that district covers what? That district. It's so it's a very gerrymandered district, which probably does not surprise anybody Anyone. who's mm -hmm. listening. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it includes Westchester, so all of Pelham, Pelham Manor, uh, Chester Park, and then a little bit of Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. It's Fleetwood, mm -hmm. and then in the it's mainly in the Bronx. So it's Riverdale, a little bit of Kingsbridge, Castle Hill Park, Chester, Bedford Park, Westchester Square, City Island, Pelham Parkway, Pelham Bay, Country Club, Morris Park, Throgs Neck, Hunts Point, Rikers Island. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very, very wow. diverse, yes, very diverse, very um, gerrymandered district. And it's really hard because a lot of people in District 34 don't know that they're part of District 34 because there's really not, I mean, across really many of the state Senate mm -hmm. districts, nobody is very familiar with where they're from because you could be across the street from somebody else who has a different state senator than you because of the way the lines have been drawn, mm -hmm. right. which is a problem. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we, we, what this campaign, my campaign has been trying to do is really bridge the gaps between the communities because what I have seen and what we all have seen is that the issues across no matter where you are they're all the, they're very much the same and we want to make sure that people can be in community together to talk about these things because that makes them feel less alone it makes them feel like they have a support system and they have people there who want to listen to them because if people just want to be heard and it doesn't matter where, whether you go to Hunts Point Pelham you know Mount Vernon Castle Hill everybody wants the same things they want a high quality of life. They want to make sure that their kids can go to a good school. They don't want to be in debt. They want to be able to have health care that protects them. And they deserve that. Everybody in this district deserves that. So that's what, we, that's what we're fighting for every single day in this okay. campaign. Bob, you want to start the questions off? Um, yes. Yeah, so some people have <laughs> confused, um, you know, have seen you as a kind of local um, manifestation mm -hmm. of um, uh, Acacio. Uh-huh. And, um, <coughs> you know, have really uh, looked forward to your candidacy, mm -hmm. um, believing, you know, perhaps even hoping that you might mm -hmm. be a standard bearer of the democratic socialist tradition mm -hmm. um, that um, Ocasio represents. Mm -hmm. And everyone will forgive me for, for, for forgetting her full name. Alex Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Thank you very much. Alexandria <laughs> Ocasio-Cortez. Ocasio you um, got it. But I wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I know our names I'm are sorry. I got. I got to think on my feet, y'all, and <laughs> um, I'm not doing it so well today. But I wanted to really add. Mm -hmm. um, that gives me an opportunity to ask you to share with us. Mm -hmm. You know, what is what is your political philosophy? Mm -hmm. Are you a part of that um, leftward lurch mm -hmm. um, that seems to be occurring in the in the Democratic Party? Mm -hmm. y you know. I guess it's enough. This is a good question, and I like this question because it gives me the opportunity to share that I am a real Democrat. I am a progressive Democrat. I'm not a socialist. Mm -hmm. um, but the things that I'm fighting for, and I use the word real Democrat probably, it's probably uh, very clear as to why I'm using that word, not right? Democrat because of who I'm, only. That's right. Not Democrat in name only, not someone that runs as a Democrat and then goes to Albany and does something else. Um, but um, because a lot of the things that I'm fighting for 
are very much progressive. And I mean, even you know, the New York Health Act, which I care very much about, it would create a single payer system in New York State, Medicare for all, because um, I believe that healthcare is a basic human right. Maybe some would say that that's you know, a socialistic way of, of doing medicine, but it's a, it, when you look at the numbers of that, it's actually a fiscally responsible way to make healthcare affordable to people. Um, it would save 98% of New Yorkers on healthcare costs, and it would create jobs. And so this is something that um, is very important to me. And also, I think you know, Medicare for all, as it's been polled lately, actually, is a very popular uh, policy, not only in the Democratic Party, but also in the Republican Party. And that's been very exciting to watch. But uh, definitely a Democrat, a progressive Democrat, and very proud of it. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> What other kind of policy proposals will you champion should you um, win the election mm -hmm. that cuts across mm -hmm. um, the various racial ethnic um, class lines mm -hmm. that do in fact separate um, the various constituents who will, you know, who are in mm -hmm. um, your district mm -hmm. should you win? Education, education, education. I have not stopped talking about the full funding of our public schools since day one of this campaign. It is very important to me and to my campaign that every single child and every single zip code has access to quality education. It should not matter where you are born that determines whether you have certain opportunities. And what we're seeing across many Senate districts is in, in District 34 where I'm running is that the district is owed $88 million in public school funding. Now, if you go to certain places like maybe Pelham or Riverdale, when there's funding gaps there, a lot of the parents will come together and they'll say, okay, what do we need to do? How do we make sure that all the students have what they need? You know, how do we make sure that they have their supplies and what and whatever it may be? But if you go to Castle Hill and Hunts Point, those parents do not have the time to be not only coming to PTA meetings, but they don't have the resources to be able to provide you know extra amounts of money into uh, their students' education. And so, making sure that we fully fund our public schools from the state budget is a high priority of mine. So that's the first thing because we all know that education is one of the best ways to not only come out of poverty, but to just create a future that has possibility and opportunity. Um, and education is the place that we can start that. So that's one of them. Um, housing. So it really doesn't matter where you live in this district. You could live in Westchester, you could live in the Bronx. Um, there is clearly an affordability crisis when it comes to housing. You don't have to go left or right on the street. It, it seems that houses that are just, I mean, in places that really never were desirable are a million dollars just for a two-bedroom apartment. I mean, it, it is alarming to me as someone who's young, I'm 32 years old, um, recently engaged, do not have children yet, want to have a family. Congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I got engaged the same week that I was, uh, that I decided to run for office. So it's been a wild year, although wedding next year. Mm -hmm. But it's, I mean, I think about this and I think I want a family. I want to be able to give them, uh, you know, my children, everything that, every opportunity that I've had too. And yet I look around and I think I have law school loans, uh, over one hundred eighty thousand um, dollars. Everywhere we turn, it's in almost impossible to even find an apartment that's affordable. And so, these are things that I think about, and I wonder how are we going to be able to do it? And housing in New York State is just, especially in the New York City area and in Westchester County, is becoming um, really almost out of, it's out of touch, really, with with the majority of people, and that's a problem. And so, some of the ways I want to fix that in the state Senate, there are a lot of laws that can help people, especially in the Bronx. You know, there are loopholes in our in our rent laws. We can end uh, vacancy decontrol and eviction bonuses and preferential rent and we can repeal the Erdstat law. These are all bills really that would provide protections for tenants who are living paycheck to paycheck and just want to make sure that they're in a home that they can stay in. But unfortunately, these loopholes allow for landlords to raise the rent 20%. It gives them incentives to push them out because then they can pull it off of um, the rent stabilization unit database. And so in the past 10 years or so, we've lost, I think, 95,000 rent stabilized units in New York City. And that's housing for 300,000 people. So where are these people going? Right? These are our homes. A lot of people are homeless. Not because they don't have a job, not because they're lazy, not because of any reason other than the fact that the cost of living has become unbearable. And so as, as, as a leader and as someone who would be elected, I mean, these are, these are at the top of the list because without having the basic needs met, 
you cannot even start to think about your happiness. You cannot even start to think about innovation and the future. And if we really want to be a state that pushes forward through what's, co what, what's coming and, and think about the future of work and the future of the way that you know, New York State can be a leader, we got to make sure that basic needs are, are met. And our state government is absolutely poised to do this. And so that would be something that I would champion because it's just too, it's too important right now. Now, you know, so support it or no support, you know, still got to ask you the hard questions. Yes, <laughs> so, please, so, please so do. One, so one of the criticisms as a relative of yours mm -hmm. who was arrested mm -hmm. for corruption mm -hmm. and because of that mm -hmm. um, they're like, you know, the apple doesn't fall far and this, that, and the mm -hmm. other and don't vote for her because, mm -hmm. you know, there'll mm -hmm. be continuation of that. Mm -hmm. And I would like to give you an opportunity to speak to Thank that. Thank you. I appreciate that, actually. So my grandfather and I were very close and I loved my grandfather dearly. And I can't think, uh, honestly, of, of anybody who doesn't love or adore their grandfather or even grandmother. Um, and what I will say to that is this. My grandfather made mistakes. That well, my what's family, your grandfather's name? My grandfather was Mario Biaggi, Congressman okay. Mario Biaggi, yes. Okay. Um, he's no longer with us. He passed away in 2015. He was 97 years old. Okay. Um, because of his, his older age, I was able to actually have a relationship with him. Um, but to what I was saying, uh, my grandfather made mistakes that my family has had to pay for significantly and from those mistakes come a lot of learnings and that is primarily why not only am I incredibly careful but I appreciate and understand and want to fight to make sure that we actually have ethics reform in our government that we actually have campaign finance reform in our government that our rules are clear that there is no gray area when it comes to elected officials because a lot of our ethics reform unfortunately is not strong enough actually even to allow for laws to even be um, What's the word I'm looking for? Like uh, to, to really to, to lay down. So, for example, right, the attorney general in New York state will often say it's really hard to press charges against state legislators because they're the ones creating the laws. And it's like the fox guarding the hen house. What I really want to do is make sure that the laws are clear, that we understand where the where the lines are, because it's very easy for people to cross the line. And I want to make sure never to cross the line. But just going back to the beginning of this, I was two years old when that happened. So obviously, you know, at two years old, I really didn't know very much about what was uh, going on. Um, but it, that entire experience has shaped the way that I see politics. Um, it has shaped the way that I understand how you can really cross that line. And then on the flip side, I've seen the good that he's done, which is why I'm here today. Because I cannot mm. tell you, I have, I, there's not a day that I walk through the street where I do not have somebody stop me and say, your grandfather was Mario? He helped my son get into West Point or he helped my son get a job or we were at the bottom of the barrel and we had nothing left and he helped us to get a job or he got us an apartment or whatever it, whatever it may be. So the feeling there is is very real and um, it, it really makes me feel good and it also shows me what it means to be a leader of the people because he never turned anybody away and that's exactly how I want to lead as well. Absolutely. Thank you. And for I, asking I, that I wanted to because because um, when I spoke your name a few times, some people brought that to my attention, mm -hmm. sending me all kinds of articles. Yes. Um, some people actually wanted Black Westchester to cover that during mm -hmm. the campaign. Like, oh, you're not, you're not, you know, giving everybody the full story. You're not doing the news because you're not talking about who Harrell. So I wanted you to talk I about that. No, I, and I appreciate that. And I am, I am someone who believes that the future of our party needs to be diverse, transparent, compassionate. And the transparent part is very important to me. And so there's nothing to hide here. That is what it is. And I am, I am proud to be his granddaughter. And I also learned a lot from what happened to him and to my family. And so that's, that's, again, that's part of the reason why I'm here because it's, there's two sides to it, right? There's a side that you learn the lessons from and there's a, there's a side of the good. And there's a deep amount of good that is still very much resonating, not only in the Bronx, but across this entire district. I mean, in places that I never would have thought with even Republicans, which is really, it's actually, that's very, that's probably one of the most inspiring things because he didn't, I mean, he helped everybody. It didn't make a difference where you were from, inside the district, outside the district, political party, did not matter. And that's exactly the type of leader that I want to be. Okay. Shout out to uh, State Senator Jamal Bailey, who's uh, just tuned in. Um, Shout out to Senator Bailey. So I'm yesterday yeah. at RapperCon. I definitely got a, a big bit. up, yeah, got a big up RapperCon at the end of the show, but saw him. And he was uh, introducing the DJs, the battles of the sound systems, and 
you know. And and we look forward to the senator coming um, to um, the radio show to share um, with our audience some of the legislative uh, <clears throat> agenda that he's advanced um, since he you know, was elected and, to and office I, a couple of years ago. I just want to acknowledge a couple of other po uh, elected officials. Um, Yonkers, um, City, City Council, Council President. President Mike Cater, um, White Plains City Council Member uh, Nadine Hunt Robinson mm -hmm. is on the check in. Um, uh, I think that is all the My daughter, my so, daughter. <laughs> oh, um, um, Mount Vernon City Judge Adrian. I did see her name. That did, did that popped up. Yeah. Uh, Mount Vernon City Judge Adrian Armstrong is also checking out the show. Okay. Um, I was just trying to make sure, you know, I acknowledge our elected officials. Um, and they're all tuned in right now. I just, gonna yeah, I just wanted to interject that you know, while, um, you know, family history is always mm -hmm. um, an important consideration whenever we're reviewing a um, person's qualification for any uh, position that they hold, a basic principle of justice and fairness is that we don't hold the sons and daughters guilty for the sins and, and misdeeds and mistakes <laughs> and granddaughters <laughs> um, for um, the mistakes of of their forebears and you know and yeah, if and we are going to be fair um, to sister Biagi then we've got to let her um, stand on her own record right. and we don't vote for people because their former uh, we found out the second president Bush was didn't hold his he didn't hold a candle to his father That's and, right. and I'm saying it here the current may uh, the current governor doesn't hold a candle to his father mm -hmm. I didn't always agree with his father's policies second but Bush his was father cool. Yeah, but he was, but he wasn't the man his father was, though. Yeah, he was think, nowhere near the man I, his father was. Uh, depends. Yeah. No, nah, he was not the to. man his father, and it's, but especially in New, to. but especially going in New York, the current governor is not the man that his father was, mm -hmm. who I did not always see eye to eye on his policies, but I have a lot of respect for, mm -hmm. uh, a lot more than the son that's currently mm -hmm. in office. That, that's so. It goes both ways, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely goes so both ways, and I think that's like, that's exactly the point, right? I think it's that experience has is is really why I'm here because I grew up with politics all around me. I mean, it was spoken at the dinner table. There wasn't a conversation that was had without being asked. Okay, this is your problem. What are you going to do about it? What's your service? How are you going to actually take that thing and transform it into something that le that raises it, that makes it better? And that's exactly right. I am Alessandro Biaggi. I am not Mario Biaggi, and mm -hmm. I am very proud to be running for this state senate seat. Good for you. Any questions, Lorraine? And I'm, I'm being careful because I always get yelled at because I never let Bob behind the scenes I never, though. I never let Bob After Bob the and Lorraine. I never let them. I'm monopolizing <laughs> and I never give them questions. So now we're on the spot. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, and then I'm going to hear about this <laughs> after <laughs> after the show. I'm going to hear about this after the show though. So yeah, yeah. You call me out like that when I've never done anything like that. <laughs> uh, uh, when you get to the Senate. Mm -hmm. Suppose mm -hmm. the the other seven members or whatever the other eight members out of the I think it was out of nine decide mm -hmm. that they want to do the IDC again and they come to you and they say, "Hey, Alessandra, we'll make you the leader." Hell no. Okay. Hell no. That will never happen. That what has happened in our state senate with eight. Democrats that we all elected as Democrats, and you can take Simca and maybe add nine, which is what yeah. I think you're referring to. But the, the the eight IDC members who we voted for as Democrats, we elected as Democrats, and then they went to Albany and they created this coalition to empower the Republicans without really being transparent. Talk about transparency and accountability without being transparent about it to their voters. It was it's stealing votes. And so not only would I not do that, but I don't believe a true progressive would do that. Um, and I'm a Democrat. And, and, you know, the idea that in order to work across the aisles that you have to make a deal like that, I really disagree. I really I think that right now what we need more than ever is crossing the aisle to make sure that we work together. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you betray your party. It doesn't mean that you take away the ability for the first woman, the first black woman to be the leader of a majority conference. And I will go there because I think it's an important topic. To, and this is part of the reason why I'm in this race, because 
you know, in 2012, when the Democrats, the Senate Democrats had a majority, we had 33 seats. That was the exact moment in time that my opponent said, you know what, I'm going to take away four other Democrats and I'm going to go and create this coalition with the Republicans. And instead of voting for Senator Stewart Cousins, who could have at that time in 2012, right? Now, now we're in 2018. So think about how long it's been. In 2012, could have been the first majority leader that was a woman, that was a black woman in New York State. He took that away from her and for eight years went on to not only continue to uh, grow the IDC, but to make it have enough power so much so that he had a seat at that budget table and didn't allow her to have a seat at that budget table. And I think talking about that is important because so much of what goes on in Albany is this boys club and there's four men in a room and that's how it's been and that's the culture and that's a lot of the reason why I think people don't want to or they get they turn off albany or they turn it off they say you know it's never going to change mm -hmm. and i disagree with that i think that one of the ways that we stop that is we make sure that we not only have the right people in these seats, but we have people in these seats that when they say the thing that they are right they make that pledge i am a democrat or i am a republican it doesn't matter what side you're on that you actually are that specific leader and so no, <laughs> that's, a long, well, me, that's a long answer, but awesome I would answer. never do that. Awesome let answer. me ask you a question. And yes. I was trying to figure it out in my head because um, the leader of the party in the state is our former guest. Mm -hmm. So I'm obviously right. not talking about her, but I wanted to use an example. In the national level, mm -hmm. Republicans will not push back against anything on the president even those who believe that there's right. something wrong, right. but they still told the That's party line. Um, and again, this is not about our past guests, mm -hmm. but this is just an example. Mm -hmm. If there was a Democrat that was crossing the line mm -hmm. on that level, the president is, mm -hmm. would you not speak up and told the party line, or would you hold that person accountable as you are mm -hmm. elected to do? Account of hold them accountable. So I actually see this less as a, of less as a political thing. So less as a part of a party thing and more of an integrity issue, an accountability issue and being independently minded. Part of the reason why we elect our leaders is because we want them to also have a mind of their own, right? To think we elect them because we feel aligned with their values. But then when we when they go to Albany, at least I believe this is what I want. I want my leader to go in and say, how does you know what is going on and how does this affect my district and the bigger picture which is in the state Senate the entire state at the federal level right the entire country and honestly the entire world because a lot of what happens at the federal level affects the international stage absolutely and so what's going on I mean with the Republicans not being able to call out the president I mean listen I get it you're in your party but what is this is a again this is a politically unprecedented time and a lot of the things that the president is saying are racist they are sexist they are embarrassing and yeah. they are I mean if you want to call yourself Christian I'm Roman Catholic it's not even Christian like so it, it really I mean it, it's I don't a, think he ever a, pretended to be Christian. <laughs> I, I, well, I, a lot of his leader, a I, lot right, of his right, followers right, are, right, right. right? So it's it doesn't make sense to me other than they want to just, you know, continue to hold on to the power. And I understand that, but th this is too important. This, like, I can't imagine being in a seat and not making a decision because I wanted to hold on to the seat, knowing that it was the wrong decision to make. I now, can't imagine. Let me now. Let me ask you a question. Another question. We talked about Democrats mm -hmm. running as Democrats mm -hmm. and then intending to, you know, give their support to the Republicans. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just giving you a scenario because I don't know when and where this would actually sure. happen. But in a in a situation, because I think a lot of the Republicans again on the national level are wrong. Um, if the Democrats were on the wrong side of something mm -hmm. and it affected your district that elected you, would you toe the line because you're a Democrat? Or would you, even if it meant being called out for breaking party, but it was the right thing to do because it was wrong for your district, how would you do it? So um, this question is so present because running this race right now, is is doing exactly that right so i, I want to share with i want to share why that is it resonates with me when i decided to run for this seat it was after having worked as an attorney for governor cuomo's office and i was working on different pieces of legislation the reproductive health act which would codify roe v wade the comprehensive contraceptive coverage act which would allow women to have access to contraception um immigrant bill immigration bills and just a whole bunch of things and i just got to the end of the legislative session and i thought to myself 
how could it be that in New York State we don't have these basic laws that Democrats in the majority want, right? And it's because of this group of eight state senators who are Democrats, that we've elected as Democrats, who have given the power to the Republicans now. I decided to leave that office because my state senator for my entire life was the person who created this group and was, I mean, really making all of, the New all of New Yorkers more vulnerable. As soon as I decided to run, not only was I told no, I was told, how dare you? It's not your turn. Uh, you'll never raise any money. Nobody will ever be with you. You won't have any endorsements. Um, get in line. Not the time to be running against a Democrat, to which I said, I'm not running against a Democrat. <laughs> I'm running against a Republican. He has proven himself through his record. And just a lot of crazy things. And I mean, this is like establishment Democrats. I am a Democrat. I am proud to be a Democrat. And that, that threw me off because that made me think, am I, like, am I doing something bad? And I had to stop literally in real time and say, no, I'm not. I get it. When you're part of, a, of, of an establishment for a very long period of time, you want to protect your own. But what we are seeing now, and, and we are now nine and a half months into this race, we have individuals who are part of the Democratic Party who are standing next to me and endorse my campaign to say that behavior is not only wrong, but we need to make sure that we have a Democratic state Senate that we can trust, that we have people in these seats that we can trust are actually Democrats. And so what I'm doing right now, I believe is the best thing for the district because the district right now has been represented by somebody who has not put the interests of tenants first. He's put the interests of real estate developers first, who have not put the interests of public school children first, has put the interests of charter school owners first and hedge fund managers. And listen, there's nothing wrong with those people, but the problem that I have with this is that you, you come into the district and you say you care about these things and you, and you make people believe that you're going to fight for them. And then when you go to Albany, you do the completely opposite thing. And that's a problem. And so I would say that this race is kind of like a, is a stand up against that. And that's, it's very much against, I mean, the party is divided right now in, in terms of who's on which side. But I believe that there's a good side and that there's a bad side. And we're trying to fight for the best. Let me ask you the question in another way, sure. too. Sure. Um, okay. So would you rubber stamp a, a, a whatever that mm -hmm. your party wanted mm -hmm. just because the party wanted it even if you felt mm -hmm. you the person the, mm -hmm. the elected official mm -hmm. felt that it really wasn't good for your district would you rubber stamp it just to go along with the party just to support the party because you're supposed to toe the line mm -hmm. so, no okay and so. that doesn't mean i would vote with republicans what it means is i vote my conscience and understand i like the most important thing to me is having an ear to the ground and being able to understand what the needs of the district are, right? So that means that if, if the district needs something and, and the majority of Democrats are, I don't know, I can't even think of an example, honestly, because I feel like so much of what the Democrats do, I'm so aligned with. Right. But I can never imagine um, just voting a certain way simply because everybody else does. That, that following mentality, that, that is not the way that my mind has ever thought, and that's not the way that I've ever led. Uh, and, I, and I ask that a lot because of what's going on on the national level. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that with the Republicans. Yes. And the Republicans are actually accusing the Democrats right. of that. But when they were in control and it was the other way around, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it seemed that way too. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, I just wanted to, you know, personalize that mm -hmm. to you. I appreciate that. I mean, we saw this with the tax bill, also with um, the health bill, uh, you know, making sure that uh, people's lives are safe, that people have access to health care, um, that we're not harming people in the way that we legislate should be the, the most, the highest priority to all of us. And the way that we should think about leading is if I say yes or no to something, how does this affect the human beings behind this decision? Because that's at the end of the day, it's not just words on a piece of paper. There are human beings behind so much of what we do. And I feel like we've really lost touch with that and that's a that's a problem and so a lot of what I want to do as well is humanize policy and and think about the word even the words that we use in our legislation how do these are these words compassionate do these words make people feel taken care of and held are we holding space for everybody's opinions to come to the table I mean I think that that's such a big it's, it's a big priority of all of us but if we're actually going to run campaigns and be leaders of the people and and have grassroots movements and be part of a movement then we're going to have to do it differently and part of doing it differently is thinking about the people on the other side of what our decisions are and that really matters because in district 34 i've been 
knocking on, I mean, I've lived here, but the point is that I've knocked on doors for months and you can't walk four feet without hearing someone's pain. And that is, I don't, I mean, how can you sleep at night? Really, how can you sleep at night? Not only are people afraid that they're going to be taken from their homes if they're immigrants, but they're afraid that their children are not going to have opportunities in schools. They're, I mean, people who are homeowners are telling me that they can't, I mean, I, strangers telling me that they can't make their mortgage payments because they have, they have incredible taxes that have been raised or that their health bills are too high. I mean, this is, this is, a, big, this is a bigger problem, and I know it affects the national issue as well, but at the state level, people are really suffering, and it's incumbent upon us to fill those needs. Now, now I know we have more time, <laughs> and I know... You have, are on a time limit. So yes. before we do run out, I want for those who listen, who are hearing you for the first time, mm-hmm. that want to know more about you, sure. uh, website, social media, yes. how can they get in contact Absolutely. with you? So uh, my website is www.biagi4ny.com. Right. Our handle is at biagi4ny.com. That's biagi, B as in boy, I-A-G-G-I, the number four, and Y.com. And I wanted to share this because I didn't uh, get a minute to really do this, but I am fourth generation in District 34. Um, I am an attorney. I went to our public schools in Pelham, and I ha- was able to see, right, when, when a school school actually has the resources that it needs, what opportunities it can provide for all of the children in the district. And s- comparing it to other schools in our district is not only alarming, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. And uh, it is in addition to understanding the policies and having the relationships and being able to get things done in Albany, what I want to see also is our leaders have an emotional intelligence and have empathy and be able to feel the things that are going on in the district because the bridging of those two things together is such a powerful way to lead and it's the way that we're going to be able to transform our state government and honestly the rest of the world. But it starts on the ground and that's, I mean, it's critical. And so a lot of the things that you'll see on my website, they are the words I've chosen to use are on purpose. They're, they have meaning behind them because we're not just talking about climate change and criminal justice reform. We're talking about people's lives, right? And so I, I mentioned this earlier, but and it's important to me too. Rikers Island is in this district. And there are bills in the state Senate right now that can make people's lives better, right? We can have ca- and end cash bail, have speedy trial reform, um, have open discovery. And it is, it is alarming to me that I am in this race talking about these issues, not only because Rikers Island is in this district, but because these are issues that are affecting everybody. And I'm running against someone whose name is not even on the cash bail reform bill. That, is, that, should, be, that should send a shockwave through the entire state. We should want every single person that we're electing, especially as a Democrat, to be on these bills that we care about. So my, my biggest ask to all the listeners right now is pick your issue. Whatever issue it is, it could be climate, it could be women's issues, it could be education, it does not matter. And figure out what your elected has done for that specific issue, not only in the past year or the past two years, but in the past 10 years. Because I'm running against someone who's been a state senator for 14 years, and I think records will prove, right, what the priorities are and what has not been done. And that's really where we're at. How much more can we do? How can we elevate this district in a way that actually brings it forward? Yeah, I was going to say, Alexandra, that one, it it seems to me one of the most important schisms, if you will, Mm -hmm. within the Democratic Party is between um, um, corporate-oriented Democrat um, elected officials who... Um, continue to kind of champion um, free market policies that make as one of their centerpieces a steady reduction in corporate tax mm-hmm. rates um, and really has led to a shift in the, in the tax yes. burden. Um, and I wanted to know where do you stand specifically on the issue of a greater um, tax equity mm-hmm. um, such that you know, working class, middle class people are bringing home a greater proportion of their paychecks yes. and um, corporations are paying their fair share. I mean, I'm 100% in agreement with that. I think that the fact that we are putting the burden on the on our working class and our, our, our lower socioeconomic individuals who are literally working paycheck to paycheck and are being taxed sometimes at a higher rate than the millionaires and billionaires because of specific loopholes if they're hedge fund managers is outrageous. Um, and that, that also extends to corporations. I mean, 
one of the things that I care very much about is taking money also out of politics because I think that what happens is you are elected and if let's say you're elected through, I don't know, whatever, whatever special interest it is that you're mm -hmm. elected through, that should not dictate the way that you legislate, right? And there are, we're, we have these terms, the corporate Democrats, right? And so it's not to demonize them, but if you look at the records of individuals who are Democrats who've been elected through corporate money, they generally do tend to side with giving tax breaks to corporations and then really not, not prioritizing, really is the word, how our tax code and, and the taxes that we have on our working families across the state affect really all of them, not only at that level, but their children and, and what, what type of, of world that they are inheriting because of this. It, it trickles down, right? And it's not a trickle. I'm not talking about trickle down economics. I'm talking about if you tax heavily the work, working class families, they're not going to be able to save money. And then their children are not going to be able maybe to go to a specific school. And then maybe they get stuck in a specific cycle. And in order to break out of that, right, we have to make sure that our taxes and our tax system is fair. And so that's one of the reasons why I support the SALT relief bill that's in our state Senate, because unfortunately, with the tax bill that Trump has passed, a lot of people in Westchester are going to be hit by this. And we're already seeing it. The taxes are increasing significantly, and people are not going to be able to stay in their homes. And that is very unfortunate because these are these are homes that people have not only saved money to live in but they've been living there for 30 years and now they have to leave because they can't afford the taxes yeah. and there's I mean that's that we should be ashamed of that as a country and it's not just in New York it's across the whole country and I think what I predict as a young adult is that we are going to see less and less people buy houses and what's that gonna do to the housing market we're going to see less and less people invest in the market because they're not going to have money to invest in the market because they can barely pay whatever bills they have in front of them. And so it's all related. It's all linked. And I just, you know, giving corporations more breaks, I think, is very unfair. There's no really other term for it, unfortunately. Questions, Lorraine? I did ask my question. Okay. <laughs> well, I do want to say, um, allow me to interject for a minute and say um, what's up to... Um, Damon K. Jones. Oh, absolutely, um, absolutely. Our um, hey, Damon. Our, 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 our absent um, co-host um, who signed in not too long ago, and I can tell you that um, your um, answers and um, philosophy really must have made an impression on, on um, uh, Damon because he, he, he's Man, in I full agreement this. that, um, you here. know, your, your um, opponent has got to go. And... Um, so yeah. lots of people, um, what you're saying is resonating mm -hmm. with a lot of our viewers. Someone said she's, she's a real go-getter. And, and Atif, um, our Mal Vernon, uh, Black Westerns of Mal Vernon uh, columnist, he was like, oh, who is this? She made me sit up in my seat. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I want to just say this. A lot, a, my dad has always said to me, you know, Alessandra, if I was taking something too seriously, he would say, you know, it's not life and death. Nothing is life and death but life and death. But absolutely this, that's i like that right and so that made that's made me have levity in my life and i'm like okay that's not too serious like right like don't cry over spilt milk but this is life and death for people it is, these yes. decisions are life and death and if you yeah. don't go into this seat and say i mean someone could be homeless because of a decision that i make that is alarming and also that means that every decision we make has got to be made in a way that has that that touch to it that understands and I feel like right now we have someone representing us who is out of touch because I'll just take one issue, right? This is the issue that got me into this race, mm -hmm. that Reproductive Health Act. In New York State, Roe v. Wade is not the law. It, our abortion laws predate Roe v. Wade. I mean, what? It's in the criminal code. And so it's not a matter of if, oh, but God. what? I know. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's in the penal mm -hmm. code. Can you even imagine mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. so, I, so that's why I thought when I saw this bill, I thought this is going to pass. Are you kidding me? And not only did the bill not come out of committee, but it just died in the state Senate. And it died at a time when President Trump passed three executive orders trying to attack women's health on, in many different ways. And he hides it in his little provisions. And so you're trying to find it and you say, oh, here we go again, attacking women's health. So now we have a Supreme Court justice nominee, right, who's mm -hmm. come up 
who has made pretty clear, I think, that Roe v. Wade is not settled law. Yes. Uh, and mm -hmm. amongst, I can't even imagine what else, right? There's a whole list of things that I'm sure he wants to roll back. That is so dangerous. And what that means is that the federal laws and our federal government are not going to be able to protect us. And guess what does? The state laws, which is why our state laws have to be as strong as possible for all of us across the board, because in New York State, we know we are leaders. This state is a trailblazing state. Everybody looks to us to see what's up with New York. What are you guys going to do? And the fact that we can't get certain basic things right is not only embarrassing, but it means that it's, gonna, it's calling for, a, it's calling for a, a, an additional level of leadership that's currently not there. And it also requires accountability and, and speaking truth to power, which is what I feel like I have been able to do this entire race, and I'm not afraid to do that. You know, like my grandma, my Italian grandma had a saying. She would say, you know, a good friend in, in Italian, so it's not going to sound as, as nice, but that's okay. <laughs> she would say, you know, a good friend will tell you that you have dirt on your nose, right? And so now, okay. you, have all these, now you have all these leaders in there. Their noses are filthy, right? Ooh. And nobody's telling each other, like, your nose is dirty over there. They're just like, you're doing great over there. Nice mm -hmm. job. Let me help you get this fundraiser. It's not about that. Right? It's like you gotta, t you gotta, we gotta like speak the truth right now. That's what everybody wants from us, and like that's how it's, we're gonna elevate our government. You, you, you know, it's, you know, it's profound Beautiful. about what you said. Hmm. So, when we first started Black Westchester in 2014, um, and a lot of it was because Damon was doing press conferences and stuff, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't show the whole thing. Um, and he, we did a mm -hmm. one particular press conference, and um, thank you, and. Um, <laughs> After after the press conference, you know, he sent me the video, mm -hmm. and it was four black parole officers who went to go get a parolee that got held at gunpoint by the Ramapo Police Department, mm -hmm. um, and they were in full uniform and everything like that. And I basically wrote this big piece, and then I then wrote a big moving piece about Memorial Field. And what someone told me, mm -hmm. they described what I do that there was a rich white man in the room, that his fly was open. And nobody was scared to, t and everybody was scared to say it. And I was the first person to say, "Hey, yo, your fly's open." And then after exactly. I said it, everybody's like, "Yeah, yeah, I noticed that it was open." And he <laughs> said, "That's what Black Westchester when we started. That's exactly what that's we did it. when I wrote the first couple of pieces." So I was interested. I was that's just amazing. interested in that you said but that. That's that, it, right? Yeah. And that's with everything. Because if you do that in small ways, then you start to do that in a little bit bigger ways. Okay, a so, bit more, so I know I told you I would I would make sure that you get out of here on time. Last words. Yes, a last word. So the election's coming up this Thursday, September 13th. And what I would ask of every single voter who is listening is to think about who you want representing you in Albany that you can trust, that will fight like hell for you there to make sure that your basic needs are met and also that will bring you to the table. What I wanna do, because I really, I see this as possible, I wanna create a political party, right? In the Democratic Party, I want our Democratic Party to be one that is inclusive, that is diverse, that's compassionate, dare I say the word compassionate, that actually has feeling, right, for what it does for all the people in the state of New York. And and I wanna I really wanna prove that we can take money out of politics and lead by the people. And the way that we do that is we continue to make sure that this movement that we're creating across the country, this is not just in New York State, across the country continues to stay strong. We continue to organize, not only in the streets, but we continue to organize in the chamber and make sure that no matter what happens, that we, that we stay true to the fact that the political currency of our time will always be us over money, that we are always stronger than the dollars that try to help to get us elected. It's not about the money, and that is where I want to lead from, and that is where I will lead from from day one until as long as I am able to serve the people in District 34. Um, quick, um, Damon K. Jones, who is my partner and mm -hmm. co-founder <laughs> co of Black Westchester yes. and who actually started this radio show, mm -hmm. um, he said, I'm with you. And he said, where do I sign up? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Damon. Yeah. We, have a, we have actually have a volunteer. So we're in, we have four days, right, until the election. Mm -hmm. If anybody wants to volunteer, Biagi4ny.com slash volunteer. There you go. We, we, could, we could use every single hand. We are people powered. We have 500 volunteers hitting the streets, knocking doors till their knuckles are bleeding, writing postcards, talking to their neighbors, writing you know letters to the editor, doing everything that they possibly can do. And we have a shoestring budget, <laughs> truly. And we've mm -hmm. been able to grow this movement because of the people, not because of the dollars. Lastly, if you, oh, if you do win the primary, do you have a 
uh, a challenger for the general election? Well, uh, my opponent is running on the independent party line, so oh, we'll oh, oh, okay, see. okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so, so uh, I, 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 yeah. I would welcome you back. Thank you. Um, after the primary, back. and I would also send out a challenge that if it is, if it comes down to that, that uh, your opponent come here and 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 challenge you. You know, I we all have. I, I, I put the offer out there that if that if, you know. Mm -hmm. We would definitely like to host that. Great. I would love that. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we want to thank you for taking the time because I know your day is busy. I know there's so much to do, especially this time. I'm honored to be here. Oh, thank you. I've been looking so forward sweet. to coming here. Yeah. I have been. Because we booked this like, what, I don't know how That's long it. ago. That's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. A long time ago. It's like last Sunday before the primary. That's, That's right. the one I want. That's the one I want. Okay. Exactly. Thank so, you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for taking the time, really. And thank you to all your listeners out there who I can't see, but I know you can hear me and I can I can see some of what you're saying. So thank absolutely. you. Thank you for being aware. It was a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. So I'm going to... Um...